Fractured Soul, Daughter of Sea and Sky, Book One, written by A. R. Colbert, narrated by Jennifer Groberg. Part One, The Reveal. Chapter One. The city was just like the movies, and in my mind I was the star, mustard stain on my shirt and all. Shoving the last bite of a hot dog into my mouth, I turned to my mom with a grin. Isn't this amazing? I asked, through a mouthful of half-chewed food. She quirked an eyebrow at me. Incredible. The sarcasm was real with this one. She dug a napkin out of her bag and passed it my way, pointing at a spot next to her lips. You've got a little something. I wiped the final evidence of street food from my mouth and sighed. With arms extended fully to both sides, I looked up at the sky and spun in a circle. I can't believe we're really here. Just a couple of gals in the big city, doing our thing, living large. Watch it. A middle-aged man in an ill-fitting business suit barely dodged my swinging arms and scowled as he scurried past. Oh, pardon me, sir, I'm so sorry. He turned back over his shoulder with his eyebrows drawn even lower and hissed for good measure. I was mortified, but it elicited a giggle from my mother. Oh, Everly, always a flair for the dramatics. I can't help it. It just feels magical here. I don't know what my future holds, but I'm glad New York is going to be a part of it for the next four to six years. It's calling to me. I belong here. You have a very vivid imagination if you think I'm paying for six years of -of out-of-state tuition. Four sounds good to me. Mom's smile faded, and she turned to me with a serious expression, though her eyes still twinkled with humor. And by the way, that's not the sound of the city calling to you. It's the sound of that cab honking for you to get out of the way. Oh, geez. I hurried across the intersection with a squeal. I definitely had a few things to learn about life in the city. It was like a different planet from where I was raised— My backwards Oklahoma hometown had little more than a livestock feed shop and a gas station, neither of which had been updated since the early 1980s. We had more cows and people, and all the visual appeal you'd expect from a North 40 farmhouse in a field of red dirt. But it was home. New York was a stimulus overload, with flashing lights and blinking advertisements on every surface. The air was fragrant sometimes leaving my mouth watering from the aroma of street foods and restaurants, and sometimes leaving my eyes watering from the intensity of its odors. Horns and shouts and laughter and music mixed together in a raucous symphony of noise. People brushed past in every direction, everyone in a hurry to get somewhere, or maybe nowhere, but hurrying nonetheless. Some were dressed in suits and ties, like Mr. Grumpface, who hissed at me. Some wore sunglasses that cost more than my car, and some wore next to nothing at all. But I was definitely the only one who dressed like she was from Hibbard, Oklahoma. At least I had on my cute boots. But as out of place as I was, New York filled some kind of a void I'd never realized I had. It made my heart sing. The city was alive, and it made me feel more alive as well. I was going to like it here. Everly? I snapped my gaze back toward my mother, who held a slight look of impatience. Did you say something? You have got to get your head out of the clouds, girl. She shook her head. We have to go back to Millie's place for dinner soon. Why the rush? I just ate a hot dog the size of my forearm— I've got a full tank for a while. She invited her friend, Claudia, over for dinner. I told her we'd be back by six. Claudia, with the son who goes to Columbia? That's the one. I told her I'm not interested in going to Columbia. She can quit trying to lure me with cute boys. Who said he was cute? I just assumed. Otherwise, why would Millie bring him over to tempt me into switching schools? 
Mom pulled me behind her as we navigated through a dense crowd and continued once it cleared out again. Hey, I don't blame you for choosing NYU over Columbia. I would probably do the same. But it is such an accomplishment to be accepted into an Ivy League school. I think she just wants you to be sure before you decline something like that. Too late, I shrugged. It's already been declined. So we can eat with Columbia Claudia and her probably cute son. But they can't make me go there. Mom shook her head and laughed. I don't think New York is going to know how to handle you. Well, they've got six years to figure it out. She shot a disapproving gaze from the corners of her eyes and held up four fingers in front of me. I took her hand and pushed three of them down, pointing her index finger at a window display up ahead. Then I swung her hand around to a copper sign with a light patina that read, Russell and Jude. Atop the sign, swinging gently with it in the breeze, sat a pure white owl. It looked a bit like the barn owls we had back home, but there wasn't a speck of color on its snowy white feathers. One more stop. I promise we'll be quick. I made puppy dog eyes at her. Please, it looks so quirky and fun. It says it's a small artist-run gallery, and that print in the window will look fabulous on my dorm room wall. Plus, that squatty little pigeon on the sign said it's worth a look. I flashed a goofy grin at my mother. The color had drained completely from her face. She almost matched the bird. Are you joking? About the owl? She whispered. She looked seriously disturbed. Of course, I laughed. I know it's not a pigeon. Weird seeing it hanging out in the middle of the city, though, huh? Are you lost, little guy? Mom turned me back to face her. Don't talk to it. Okay, I was only kidding. Let's get back to Millie's. Hang on, I was being serious about that print. Can we pop in here for a second, please? I would really like to see how much they're charging for it. I'm sure it's probably like 5,000 bucks, because New Yorkers apparently think everyone's as rich as Millie. But I just want to look real quick. I promise I won't dilly-dally. She frowned and glanced back at the owl. It seemed to be watching us. It was honestly a little creepy, but in an intriguing way. I wondered if it was part of the exhibition inside the gallery. Fine. Ten minutes, tops. Thank you. I grabbed her hand, which was frigid and clammy, and pulled her through the door. The gallery was wide open and sparse of furniture. Its tall ceilings revealed black ductwork suspended under a wooden ceiling, and the outer wall was exposed brick with enormous picture windows near the entrance. The rest of the walls were stark white, with no other distractions from the artwork inside. The space probably wasn't large as far as art galleries went. It had just two main halls. One was essentially devoid of people other than my mom and me, but the other held a small crowd at the opposite end. Ooh, I wonder what's over there, I said, dragging my poor mother along behind me. I don't like this, she mumbled under her breath. As we neared, I noticed a tall, broad-shouldered young man propped up against the wall next to the rest of the crowd. His skin was a sun-kissed bronze, and his hair was tasseled into messy perfection, the color of dark chocolate. But his eyes were what really caught my attention. They were an incredible amber, like honey, flecked with gold leaf, and they were staring straight at me. I wonder if he goes to Columbia, I snickered to my mom but she gave no witty remark in response. Her eyes were deadlocked on the boys', and she was practically snarling at him. Mom, I asked, is something wrong? We need to go, Everly, now. Just then, the crowd parted ahead to reveal the art piece everyone was fawning over. A small girl tugged on her mother's hand and pointed at me with a tiny finger. It's her, Mama! The child's mother turned to me with a broad smile. 
It's a remarkable piece, truly breathtaking. The artist captured your essence beautifully. Uh, thank you? I glanced at my mom for help to get away from this crazy woman, but she was still too involved in the stare-down with golden eyes to have noticed. The mother and child smiled warmly again as they moved toward the exit, and I stepped forward into their spot in the crowd. Finally, I saw the piece that had drawn everyone's attention. Hanging on the wall in a gilded golden frame, illuminated by a small spotlight, was a four-foot-tall portrait of me. Chapter 2 Mom? I blindly padded the air behind me, trying to make contact. I needed another set of eyes to confirm what I saw. This couldn't be possible. The painting was undeniably me. Long caramel waves of hair cascaded over the girl's shoulders, thick and full. I absent-mindedly padded down the cowlick to the left of my part as I noticed a matching tuft of hair on the girl and the painting. She even had my eyes, round and blue, except for a pie-shaped third of her left iris, which was a rich brown. Heterochromia iridum. I'd learned the term for it when I was a young girl. It was quite a mouthful for saying two different colored eyes, but I'd never forgotten it. My memory was weird like that. I never forgot anything. In fact, my photographic memory was probably the only reason I'd been accepted into Columbia. But that didn't matter right now. Mom, I repeated, are you seeing this? I tilted my head and stepped closer to the girl in the painting. She, I, we? We looked determined, fierce. That girl was the tough version of me I'd always wanted to be. Well, her expression and body language were tough anyway. Her chin was held high, almost defiant, as she leaned forward with her forearms propped on her knees in the seat. On closer examination, I noticed she was missing my scar, the one I'd gotten below my lip when I fell off my horse and landed on a rock in the second grade. Other than that small difference, she could have been my more ferocious twin. The rest of the scene didn't share the same ferocity. She wore a glimmering golden gown. The chair she sat on more closely resembled a throne. It was an ornate, oversized, high-backed Victorian chair with tufted mauve velvet cushions. I didn't recognize the room she was in. It was vast and open, with arching, leaded windows lining the wall that stretched over two stories tall. A plaque below the painting bore the artwork's name. Deliverance. Mom! I had her attention now, or rather the painting version of me did. My mom looked less surprised than angry, though. Her jaw worked as she examined the piece before us. Then she turned to me. A pink flush was working its way up her neck and into her cheeks, and she was trembling. Give me your hair tie, she demanded. The one I'm using right now? In my hair? Yes, she impatiently held out her hand. Unused to seeing my mom worked up in a state like this, I obeyed without further question. I pulled the elastic band from the back of my head and dropped it into her open palm. She pocketed it and immediately began running her fingers through my hair, ruffling it up and pulling it forward to cover my eyes. It hung wildly in my face, tickling my nose and leaving me looking like Cousin It. Is this necessary? I reached to part my hair just enough to see through the curtain before my eyes, but my mom swatted my hand back down. Don't touch it. Wait right here. I'm going to talk to the artist. She turned on her heels and disappeared through the crowd. I spun around to follow her and found myself staring into a broad chest covered by a snug-fitting navy blue t-shirt. Slowly, my eyes moved up higher and higher again, past a strong, scruffy jawline, full lips twisted into a crooked half-grin, chiseled cheekbones that looked like they'd been carved from granite, and into the glistening golden eyes of the boy who'd watched us walk in. Can I have your autograph? His low, rich, baritone words danced through the air, messing with my senses. 
I giggled nervously. You want me, I mean, my, uh, that's not me. You don't want my autograph. He pushed a section of my untamed hair to the side, and his fingers left my temple tingling where they'd brushed against my skin. He was very forward for a stranger, and if he'd looked like anyone else, I might have balked at him touching me like that. But this was no ordinary guy. He could touch me all he wanted. Are you sure? One side of his perfect mouth pulled up into that charming, crooked grin again. Because it sure looks like you. I giggled again. I was acting like a lovesick preteen, but I couldn't help it. The longer I stood near him, the more enamored I became. He must have been a model. This was New York, after all. I'm sure, I finally mumbled through a bashful smile. I dropped my chin, allowing my hair to fall forward over the edge of my eye again. The boy closed his eyes and took a sharp breath before slowly opening them again. He allowed his grin to reach full capacity, displaying a perfect set of white teeth, and I almost swayed in place. I was actually going weak in the knees, like some kind of cartoon. What was wrong with me? Well, at least tell me your name. Everly. It rolled out of my mouth before I could consider otherwise. Everly, he repeated. It sounded so much better coming from his lips, slow and smooth like honey. Everly! I startled and turned to face my glowering mother stomping toward us. When I looked back over my shoulder, the boy was gone. What are you doing? She immediately pulled more of my hair forward when she reached me. I blew it back out of my face. Just enjoying the most delightfully bizarre encounter of my life, I sighed. I thought I taught you not to talk to strangers, she frowned. I wasn't buying her attempt to be funny. She was still visibly shaken. I can't say no to a stranger who looks like that, I grinned. Speaking of strangers, did you find the artist? I swear I don't know how he painted this. He must have found one of my 4-H clippings from the Hibbard newspaper or something. I seriously doubt that. And no. She glanced around the room. But he's here. How do you know? Her frown deepened. I can just feel it. If you say so. My mother was starting to sound like she had a few screws loose. Of course, I'd never say that to her face. She ran her hands up and down the sides of her arms, scanning the room as she did. Maybe we should just go. Let's get back to Millie's for now, and we can figure this out later. It's really not that big of a deal. It's not even me in the picture. It just looks like me. She's missing my scar. My mom's jaw dropped. I knew it, she muttered. I followed her gaze to the lobby, where the early evening sunlight was filtering in through the windows in wide golden rays. Gliding through the sunshine like it was his own personal spotlight came a thin, pale man, probably in his fifties. He stood ramrod straight, like a metal bar held him firmly in place under his clothes, and his feet stepped so softly across the wood floor that he almost appeared to be floating. His hair was stark white and pulled up into a high top knot on his head. He wore all black, which contrasted sharply with his ghostly coloring. He strode over to the front of our hall and turned to face the crowd of onlookers. A small group meandering toward the exit stopped to compliment him, but he never once looked in their direction. He didn't acknowledge their existence at all. He simply stared straight ahead. Maybe he was blind, or deaf, or maybe just stuck up and indifferent. Is that the artist? I asked. Mom didn't answer. She was already walking toward him. Good luck with that. To my surprise, he turned to face her as she approached. It was only then that I saw his eyes. With his fair skin and white hair, I'd expected them to be pale as well. But they were dark darker than brown, almost onyx. I inhaled sharply as his two black holes took in my mother, who by all accounts looked fearless. 
Based on body language alone, I would have guessed she was screaming at him. And with the way her hands waved back and forth in front of her, it was probably very colorful language. But in reality, I couldn't hear a thing. The acoustics in the gallery were horrible. The artist wasn't intimidated. He remained straight-faced as she berated him. His mouth moved in response, but the rest of his face and body were eerily still. A few eyes from passers-by glanced in my direction, clearly associating me with the woman causing a scene. I needed to put some distance between us before I got dragged into the kerfuffle as well. I glanced around the room again for golden eyes. He was much more fun to talk to than my angry mother. Plus, I hadn't gotten to ask for his name. But he was gone. He'd probably bolted out of there as soon as my mom came unhinged. I couldn't blame him. I wanted to get out of there, too. Mom, I called out. She held one finger out to the side to quiet me and continued speaking to the artist. I tapped my foot impatiently, watching and waiting for my chance to jump in and pull her away. I was sure it was just a coincidence that his painting resembled me. There was no need to carry on like this. I was so intent on stopping her at my first opportunity that I failed to see any commotion outside. There were no masked men nor grand villainous speeches, no abandoned suitcases or shifty-looking men in the shadows. There was just a boom. Then a thousand things happened at once, instant chaos. My first indication that something had gone awry was a jolt of pain in my tailbone. I'd fallen. No, I'd been blasted to the ground. I looked up to see shattered glass filling the lobby floor. The white-haired artist reached down and pulled my mom to her feet, then pointed down the opposite hall. Once the ringing in my ears had quieted down to a shrill hum, I heard the cries of fear. Suddenly it all came together. There had been an explosion on the sidewalk outside of the gallery. "'Go, young lady! What are you waiting for?' An older woman pushed me in the back with her handbag, and I jumped to my feet. My mom was only a few yards ahead, looking over her shoulder as the artist dragged her toward a doorway down the opposite hall. The rest of the crowd followed closely behind. Come on, Everly. It's going to be okay. Chapter 3 I looked up into the enchanting, gold-flecked eyes of Mr. Model. It's okay, he repeated. I've got you. Hesitantly, I placed my fingers into his outstretched hand and allowed him to pull me to my feet. Again, my palm came alive where our skin touched. It buzzed with warmth and comfort. And despite the tragedy taking place around us, I felt compelled to giggle again. Don't be stupid. My mom, I said weakly. She's up ahead. We're all going to the same place. They're ushering us into the basement until they can figure out what's going on. I stepped up on my toes, trying to catch a glimpse of my mother ahead, but there were too many people between us. I did spot a snowy white topknot, however. It was safe to assume she was still with the artist. I released a breath and continued forward, fingers still wrapped in the warm grasp of the tall, handsome stranger beside me. Was anyone hurt? I don't think so, he said. It was probably just some prank, but they've got to clear the area to investigate. The authorities are on the way. We may be stuck here for a while. Stuck here, huh? He quirked a perfectly arched eyebrow at me, and my stomach did a flip. I didn't know how to handle myself around him. We didn't have fine specimens like this back in Oklahoma. Perhaps sensing my reaction to him, he flashed that crooked grin at me again, and I had to look away. He was too dang charming. I couldn't get swept up in a girlish crush when I should be focusing on not stepping on shrapnel from the explosion that had just separated me from my mother in a giant unfamiliar city. Outside the broken windows in the lobby, I noted even more of a mess. A trash can laid on its side in the middle of the sidewalk— in Hibbard, the whole town would have gathered around to check out the scene. 
They'd be gossiping about it for months, recounting the event and making it larger and more deadly every time they told the story, like the freshwater shark Bobby Dolman supposedly caught from the pond behind his granddaddy's house. But here, it was as though the New Yorkers didn't even notice the smoke still billowing from the metal can. They stepped around the shards of glass, looks of annoyance painting their hurried faces. The lack of response could have convinced me that this was a daily occurrence in their world. Aside from a few people who'd been scraped up by the blast, no one seemed to care much at all. Thankfully, there didn't appear to be any major injuries. I glanced up at the sign again, swaying in the breeze. The owl was gone, leaving only the names of the artists, Russell and Jude. I wondered which one my mom had scolded. Finally, we reached the door at the opposite end of the other hall. The clean, hip, and modern aesthetic of the main gallery did not continue past the doorway. Here the building really showed its age. We funneled into a dark stairwell leading down into the basement. A single flickering bulb lit the way down the creaky wooden steps. The air was musty and increasingly chilled the further we descended. The odor reminded me of our storm cellar back home. I'd spent way too many spring evenings down there, avoiding tornadoes that never came anywhere near our little farmhouse. Much like right now, I was escaping a prank that had already taken place and similarly posed no real threat. But it was better to be safe than sorry, I supposed. That's what my mom always said during storm season. On the next step, my foot slipped, knocking me off balance. I reached for the handrails, but there were none on the narrow stairwell. My hand slid across unfinished drywall as I attempted to correct my balance. If I tumbled down these stairs, I'd take out ten other people with me, like a human bowling ball. But two large hands grabbed my waist, effortlessly catching and steadying me on the stairs. Warmth buzzed through my core, like static electricity softly licking its way up my spine. I gasped and turned to face a smiling set of golden eyes. I'd officially made more physical contact with this male model than I had any of the 13 boys in my graduating class. Thanks. My pleasure, he grinned. Oh, my stars, I do not need to think about the word pleasure coming from his perfect mouth. I turned back to the front and finished my descent. We were two of the last people to reach the basement. It wasn't as musty in the open room below the gallery. Soft light filtered in through a couple of small windows high on the outer wall, and fluorescent lighting illuminated the rest of the room. Tall metal cabinets lined the perimeter of the room, and a few enclosed glass cases stood in the middle. They contained various vessels of pottery and strange sculptures. I found my mother sitting on the floor next to one and hurried to join her. She sighed with relief at my arrival, swiping the hair out of my face with both hands and then pulling me into her chest for an embrace. Oh, Everly, I hoped this would never happen. I pulled back from her arms, taking in the worry lines etched around her eyes. Well, nobody hopes they'll get to experience an explosion, but all things considered, this wasn't as bad as far as bombs go. She forced a breathy laugh through her lips and pulled me in again. You're right, it wasn't a bad bomb. I allowed her to hold me against her side for longer than the situation required before finally prying myself away again. Mom? Yes, dear? I didn't want to offend her, but I'd never been good with delicate situations. You've been a little, uh, erratic today. Is everything okay? She smiled for real this time, but there was still something pained behind it. I'm sorry, I've been acting strange. It's not every day you stumble into a gallery to find a portrait of your daughter on display. Right. Of course that would be startling. It had startled me as well. But it's not me, remember? No scar. Mm. She pressed her lips together and stared off into the distance. What did the artist say when you asked him about it? She shrugged. 
must be a coincidence. Well, that settled nothing, but whatever. She was in some kind of state right now that I didn't want to deal with. I'd ask more once she had a chance to settle down after dinner. Thank you, everyone, for remaining calm. A thin man stood at the foot of the stairs. He had a colorful silk scarf wrapped around his dainty neck and an air of superiority. I'm Jude. He glanced around the room, giving us all time to acknowledge that he was one of the gallery's artists. Then, as if that wasn't enough, he added, I hope you all enjoyed a peek at our work upstairs. Authorities are quickly working to clear the glass and rule out any foul play. I expect we'll only be required to wait here for a short time before they release us. But lucky you. Under these strange circumstances, you now have the honor of previewing more art and artifacts from our personal collections, pieces never before exposed to outside eyes. He smiled proudly. Had he been the one to paint my portrait? I glanced at my mother, but saw no recognition in her tired eyes. Whoever he was, he didn't rile her up like the white-haired man had. And speaking of good old Topknot, who must have been Rossell by process of elimination, where had he gone? I looked around the dimly lit space and couldn't find him. I didn't see golden eyes either. A doppelganger portrait, a gorgeous guy, finer than any work of art in the gallery, who seemed to take some level of interest in me. A bomb, a shaken mother, an old hipster with black eyes. This day couldn't get any weirder. I love New York. Jude continued droning on about his fine collection, and I peered through the glass case we were leaning against. There were some really cool pieces in there. I wondered why they would be here in the basement rather than on display upstairs or even in a museum if they were as valuable as Jude led us to believe. Some of the most interesting items resembled Egyptian drawings I'd seen in school, but they were formed into figurines carved from gold, maybe a foot high. I admired the fine details carved into the metal, the subtle variations in the wings of the humanoid figures, and scales upon their reptilian heads. They were bizarre and captivating. Mom, look at this stuff. I turned to see her reaction, but her eyes were closed. Her mouth moved quickly, silently reciting some unknown string of words. Sorry, are you praying? She didn't respond, so I turned back to look at the pretty collection. My eyes were drawn next to an old coin, the size of a half dollar. It was thin and rubbed almost smooth in spots, but there on the surface of the darkened metal was the outline of an owl, much like the one I'd seen outside of the gallery. I knew he was probably a part of the exhibition somehow. These guys seemed to have a fascination with ancient artifacts and Egyptian history. I had to admit, it was pretty interesting. I nudged my mom. Maybe this is what I'll study at NYU. I think these ancient civilizations are incredible. Like, how on earth did they have the technology to create stuff like this? Her eyes snapped open. No. She faced me with a wild ferocity. No? I was taken aback by her forceful response. We'd been trying to come up with ideas for my major all summer— I thought she'd be thrilled that I'd finally found something that interested me. There's no money in the field. Jobs are hard to come by. You should look at finance. She blurted the words flippantly, thoughtlessly. I'd rather dig ditches than get into finance. I curled up my lip. Besides, life isn't all about money. I think this stuff is amazing. I wouldn't mind working for peanuts if it meant I'd get to learn about the way people lived thousands of years ago. Maybe I could even go to Egypt. You know, dig around in the pyramids a little? I nudged her with my elbow again. No. She practically barked at me. Her brows pulled low and her mouth twisted to one side like she was enduring some kind of internal battle. I'd never seen my mom behave as strangely as she was today. In fact, maybe New York isn't right for you either. 
let's stick to what you know. Oklahoma State has a great ag economics program. That had escalated way too quickly. I was going to have to lay off the sarcasm for a bit. Where is this coming from, Mom? I'm already enrolled. All my stuff... Enough, she whispered harshly. We're getting you out of New York. Tonight, if we can. Chapter 4 Matilda Gordon? Jude looked up from the piece of paper held in his hand. Matilda Gordon? He repeated, glancing around the basement. Mom's jaw clenched as she looked his way and then back at me. Are you going to answer him? I asked. No, I don't know him. He's probably looking for someone else. You're right. This basement is probably full of Matilda Gordons. She pursed her lips and pulled out her phone to check the time. We should have left already. We're going to be late for dinner. I'm sure Millie will understand, given the bomb and all. Maybe we can create a distraction to get them out of the stairwell so we can get out of here. She looked around for something that might work. Mom, what is really going on here? Matilda? Matilda Gordon? Jude looked irritated. He glanced over his shoulder at the man behind him. I hadn't noticed him there earlier, but Russell stood in the shadows, his white man bun giving him away even in the low light. Jude didn't appear to know who my mother was, but Russell's dark eyes were pinned on her. His eyes were menacing on their own, but his expression wasn't hardened. It was blank, just as it had been upstairs. I looked back to my mother, who was rubbing her temples with fingers from each hand. She was clearly distressed. She squeezed her eyes shut tight, then opened and fixed them on me. Everly, I have to tell you something. The other people in the basement were beginning to murmur amongst themselves, trying to locate the Matilda being summoned by the artists. I suppose they thought the authorities were requesting her. They were probably growing more uncomfortable with each passing second. I sensed my mother's urgency. What is it, Mom? I... She hiccuped and placed her fingers on the front of her throat. She shook her head and tried again, more quickly this time. I'm fr... Again, she couldn't complete her thought. She launched into a sudden coughing fit, drawing stares from the rest of the crowd. Her eyes watered, cheeks red. The cough was so intense that it finished with a choking gag-like noise. She wiped her eyes with her knuckles and sighed. You're way too worked up, Mom. Whatever it is, it's not too big for us. We've handled worse. We can handle this, too. I was really starting to worry now. I'd never seen her like this. This is different, sweetheart. This isn't like anything you've ever encountered before. It... She began dry heaving. I looked around, panicking, and grabbed a stranger's glittery pink water tumbler, twisting off the lid and shoving it under my mom's face just in time to catch her hot dog from earlier. Gross. I cringed and glanced back at the woman I'd taken the cup from. Keep it, she said, horrified. I insist. I shrugged and twisted the lid back into place. Then I turned back to my poor mother. I knew she wasn't ill. She just worked herself into some extreme state of anxiety. Okay, I said. No more talking. Do you want some gum? Her eyes widened, and she nodded emphatically. She began digging around in her own purse while I retrieved a stick of gum from mine. I passed the minty goodness to her as she victoriously yanked a blue ballpoint pen from the depths of her mom bag. She quickly unwrapped the gum and shoved it into her mouth, spreading the wrapper out on her knee and wiping away the powdery residue from the candy. Bringing her pen to the papery lining of the foil wrapper, she paused— then, as though the words had finally formed in her mind, she began to write. The only problem was the lidless pen that had been buried in the bottom of her purse for who knows how long didn't have any ink. She scribbled in circles, trying to make some color appear on the small piece of paper. 
She tapped the tip rapidly on the cement floor of the basement and tried once more, grunting as it failed again. She huffed and threw the pen across the room, nearly hitting the elderly woman who had urged me down here with her handbag earlier. Mom, I scolded. Calm down. You're drawing attention. She was. Jude had spotted her, and Rossell had emerged from the shadows. He approached us slowly from the stairwell. Mom shook her head and snatched my bag, shuffling around until she found another pen. Gel, because I was a bit of a pen snob, and there was no better writing utensil. Clicking it open, she tried to write again. This time she got one letter. I... Then her hand started shaking too violently for her to pen another line. She grabbed her right wrist with her left hand and flexed her fingers gently. Russell was close. He'd almost reached us when she attempted to write again. She got an A-T on the paper, barely legible, before her whole body started convulsing. Mom! I shouted. Russell leaned down by her side. He looked at me with those empty black eyes, but he didn't appear cruel. He was flat and emotionless. She's having a seizure, he said matter-of-factly in a raspy voice. What? She doesn't have seizures. I put my hands on her shoulders and held her until she stopped moving. Her chest rose and fell several times before she looked at me. She parted her lips to speak but Russell shook his head. No, Tilly, the oath. She met his eyes briefly and then looked back over at me as she lifted herself onto her feet. I love you, darling. She smiled sadly and studied me for just a moment more before she took Russell's hand. Mom? I stood too. Where are you going? Jude called out that the mess had been resolved and everyone was free to go. Immediately the room burst into a flurry of activity. The other people trapped in the basement were probably just as anxious to get away from us as they were glad that there was no real threat above. Ignoring the bodies shuffling around me, I reached out for my mom's arm. Wait up! Russell paused and looked at my mother. She frowned, then turned back to me. Don't forget to take your vitamins. My vitamins? Mom, wait, hang on. Russell tugged her forward, and another group of people shuffled between us, separating us just before I reached the staircase. I practically shoved the man in front of me. He was moving too slowly. My mom was up there, being dragged away by some stranger and saying crazy things that sounded an awful lot like goodbye. But she wasn't leaving me. She wouldn't, right? Why didn't she fight against him? And how did he know her name? And most importantly, why didn't she wait for me at the top of the stairs? My heart sank when I finally emerged back up in the hall of the gallery. The glass had been cleaned up, and yellow caution tape was wrapped around the jagged glassless window frames. But my mom was still moving. She was several yards ahead, almost back to the lobby. Mom! I shouted for what felt like the hundredth time. Please stop! I jogged ahead and muttered under my breath. Why are you leaving me? One parent abandoning me was enough. I couldn't bear the thought of losing my mother, too. But she didn't turn around. She didn't stop. Chapter 5 Why the long face? A deep voice asked from behind me. I paused just long enough to find golden eyes approaching. I think there's something wrong with my mom, and she's leaving without me. I wasn't normally the type to spill my guts to strangers, but I didn't have time to chit-chat. He placed a warm hand on my back as I turned to catch up to her again. Then he leaned in close. She's not leaving. She's just getting a drink. I followed his gaze over to the lobby, and sure enough, she stood with Russell, swallowing down a glass of water. I released a lungful of air and smiled. Oh, thank goodness. I could breathe again. I knew my mother would never abandon me, 
That's not who she was. But my heart still pounded at the thought of it. It's cute the way you look after her, he said. I turned to face him, lifting my chin to make eye contact. He stood a head taller than me. He had to have been at least six and a half feet tall. And he looked amused, the light from the gallery reflecting off the golden specks in his irises. What's your name? He raised two dark brows. My name? You're the celebrity here. Why do you care to know my name? He flashed a full white grin. The scruff framing his mouth was endearing. With his perfect teeth and impossible eyes, the scruff kept him grounded. Without it, he would have been too pretty, unnaturally attractive. But who was I kidding? He was out of my league either way. Because if we're going to keep running into each other like this, I'd like to be able to address you by your name instead of mentally referring to you as Golden Eyes. Oh, Golden Eyes, I like that. It makes me sound mysterious. It does, I agreed. Like a secret agent. A man on a mission, he winked. I laughed. So, agent, are you going to tell me your name or what? He raised a brow and dropped his chin. You can call me Clark. Tate Clark. Well, Tate Clark, mission accomplished. Thank you for helping me stay calm today during some really weird events. It was my pleasure. The only payment I request is your autograph. I felt my cheeks grow warm. Not that again. I told you that isn't me in the portrait. He shrugged. Maybe not, but it's such an enchanting painting. His eyes cut over toward the other hall before settling on me again. He jerked his chin to the wall, motioning for me to follow him off to the side. With one more quick glance at my mother, I joined him. I could have sworn it was you when you walked in. I couldn't take my eyes off of you. My cheeks were on fire now. I had a tendency to get really awkward when complimented, and this was like the greatest compliment in the universe. I didn't know how to respond. Go on, I said playfully. Internally, I groaned at my dumb reaction, but Tate didn't look annoyed. He chuckled and leaned his shoulder against the wall, turning his body inward toward me. She looks like a goddess. She's captivating in every way. I just want to be near her. His golden eyes were fixed on mine, and I couldn't look away. It was like an invisible string tethered me to him. I'm still not convinced it isn't you. His words slowed my breathing. They blocked out any noise or distractions around us. He was just inches away. I could feel the warmth radiating from his chest. Involuntarily, my chin lifted up and forward. His eye shot down to my lips, and I held my position, waiting. Waiting for what? For him to kiss me? What on earth was I doing? He was clearly some playboy who'd swept me up with his magical words. I dropped my chin again and cleared my throat. Well, Agent Clark, I'd better get back to my mom. So stupid. I backed away, and he remained propped up by the wall, that charming half-grin plastered on his pretty playboy face. When will I get to see you again, Everly, girl who isn't in the painting? I don't know, I shrugged. New York is a big city. Probably never. Now several feet away from him, my head seemed to clear, and I just wanted to make sure my mom was okay. He crossed his arms. I'm sure it'll be sooner than never. I shot him a skeptical look. Goodbye, Tate. It was nice to meet you. See you around, he grinned. I rounded the corner into the lobby, surprised to find it empty. I rushed through into the only other hall. It was empty, too. The painting of me, or almost me, stared defiantly from the opposite end. Mom? The room was silent. I whirled around back toward Tate, but he was gone, too. What was going on? Mom? I yelled again. Tate? Everyone had disappeared. 
I jumped through one of the now empty window frames back out onto the busy street, careful not to scrape myself on the glass. I ducked under the caution tape and immediately stepped back into the world of motion that was NYC. The wave of passerby started around me, ignorant of my panic and too distracted to care. My head swiveled back and forth, scanning the busy streets, but there was no sign of my mom anywhere. No top knots, no tall, handsome strangers. It was like I dreamed up the whole afternoon. A police car was parked by the curb in front of the gallery. Two officers sat inside, pounding out notes on an outdated laptop. I ran up and banged on the passenger's window with the palm of my hand. The officer inside furrowed his brows. He took his time closing up the computer where he typed and rolled down the window. Can I help you, miss? Yes. Were you working the explosion over here? I gestured toward the gallery. Yeah. He looked annoyed. The driver watched our exchange silently, pulling a disposable cup of coffee up to his mouth and taking a long sip. Did you happen to see where everyone went? Uh, nope. I frowned. One of the artists is a thin man with white hair. He wore it in a bun. You couldn't miss him. He was with my mom, and I can't find them. Are you sure you didn't see them leave? He shook his head. Can't help you. Sorry. The window started moving back up, closing me out. Wait! I slid my hand into the narrow opening, forcing the officer to keep it down a little longer. What now? I'd like to file a missing persons report, please. He rolled his eyes. We can't file a report for your mommy, sweetheart. Did you check the bathroom? Maybe she's going potty. The driver snorted. My hands clenched into fists. Why was this officer being such a jerk? Sheriff Halsey back home would never speak to me this way. Couldn't he see I was distressed? Fine, I'll file it for myself then. I'm missing. Can you please return me to my mom? He huffed. How old are you? Eighteen. You're a legal adult. Find your own way home. The window began rolling up again, even with my finger still perched on top of it. Hang on, I cried out, but my plea was ignored. I pulled my hand out at the last second. The officer opened his laptop again and motioned for me to go. Ugh, I kicked his tire. Blub, blub. The car chirped at me. The officer sat inside, scowling. That was a warning. I'd better watch it or I'd be in even bigger trouble. I circled back around to the front of the gallery and dropped to the sidewalk, leaning my back against the wall. Surely she was going to come back for me. She wouldn't go to my aunt's house without me. If I left to search the streets, I'd miss her, and even if she didn't return right away, Rossell would definitely come back at some point, and I could ask him about her then. Fumbling through my bag, I located my phone and dialed the only New York number I knew. Millie, hey, it's Everly. I'm gonna miss dinner tonight. Chapter 6 Millie arrived within minutes. Her driver maneuvered a black luxury sedan into a tight spot in front of the gallery, parked, and exited to open my aunt's door for her. I loved my Aunt Millie, I really did, but she was one of the most eccentric women I'd ever encountered. Even the way she exited the vehicle was a bit of a production. She extended one lean leg out of the car first, pointing her toes as though she wanted everyone on the sidewalk to admire the hot pink heel on her foot. Then she stood tall, revealing shiny silver shorts that appeared to be made of mylar, and a pale blue blouse with giant boxy sleeves shaped like milk jugs. Her lipstick matched her heels, and smoky dark lines of coal rimmed her crystal blue eyes, which were almost the same shade as her shirt. She was a beautiful woman, but she took the high fashion magazines a little too literally, and she definitely didn't look like your average neighborhood pharmacist. Mom and I always joked that by pharmacist, Millie was actually telling us she was a drug dealer for the rich and famous. That would better explain her vast wealth, anyway. 
but beneath her extreme attire and over-the-top luxurious lifestyle, Millie had a heart of pure gold. Heverly! She shuffled through the crowd, heels clicking loudly on the sidewalk, and wrapped me in a hug. You called at the perfect time. We were just returning to the house with some extra cheese for dinner tonight. We were just around the corner there. Cheese? Yes, it's a cacio cavallo imported from... Uh, never mind. Tell me what happened. I filled her in with a quick, pared-down recount of the afternoon, starting with the painting and finishing with my rejection by the police officers, who were still parked by the curb. I see, she said, tapping her foot on the sidewalk. Go back to the part where you last saw her. She was taking a drink of water. Why didn't you join her then? I was, uh, talking to someone. Hmm. Millie pursed her lips, a knowing look on her face. Thankfully, she didn't push the issue. I was pretty embarrassed about losing track of my mother because I had been too caught up batting my lashes at Tate. Even if he was quite googly-eye worthy, losing my mother wasn't worth it. You're right, my aunt continued. It's not like her to leave, but I can't imagine the artist has any nefarious intentions. Perhaps she found him attractive, and they went to get drinks. Millie! She would never ditch me to go get drinks with some artist. Besides, I told you she was angry with him, like unnecessarily angry. It was honestly a little over the top. Not if he was some stalker who'd been following you. Stalker? Really? He knew your face well enough to paint it, didn't he? Well, if that were the case, she certainly wouldn't have grabbed drinks with him. She frowned. I suppose not. This is strange indeed. She looked around. Stay here. I'll be right back. I watched Millie stride over to the police car with enough confidence to convince them she was the Queen of New York. She stopped with her feet together and folded her body forward at the waist, leaning toward the window with an innocent smile on her lips and a sweet little wave. Hi, officers! The passenger rolled his window down with much more interest than he'd shown me earlier. Hello, ma'am. The driver leaned over and waved to her as well. Don't look too eager, boys. I rolled my eyes. I hate to bother you, but my niece here thinks she may have left something inside the gallery earlier, you know, during all the chaos, and now the owner seemed to have vacated the premises. She pouted. Would you mind if we took a look inside? I promise we won't be long. I'm afraid this is private. That would be just fine, ma'am. The officer in the driver's seat unabashedly interrupted the passenger. He grinned, flashing a mouth full of yellow teeth. Take all the time you need. We'll even keep a watch out here for you, just to make sure nothing shady is lurking around the corner. He winked at her. Gross. Thank you very much. We'll be quick. She returned to her full height and brushed the front of her metallic shorts. After you, she said to me, gesturing toward the open window. Why don't we just take the door? I asked. If you insist, she shrugged and pulled the doors open. Inside, an eerie silence still hung heavy in the air. Hello? Russell? Jude? No answer. The place was a ghost town. The painting is over that way. I directed Millie to the hall on the left. I'm going to check the basement again in case she snuck back down there while I was talking earlier. Millie gave me a thumbs up, then walked away humming a Beatles tune. Her song and the clicking of her heels were a welcome break in the silence. I turned down the other hall toward the basement door. The same lonely light flickered overhead as I tiptoed down the staircase. Hello? I called out again for good measure, but I knew no one would respond. The basement was empty, just as I'd expected, but with the crowds cleared out, I was able to take a closer look at the room. Drabby filing cabinets lined the walls, 
though I suppose they might have held some pretty fascinating items behind their dull band-aid-colored exteriors. But the real stars of the show were the glass cabinets. One on the far side of the room was emitting a neon blue glow. Curious, I decided to take a closer look. Subconsciously, I knew it was wrong to snoop through other people's private collections. My body tried to warn me, with the hair rising on end across my arms and the back of my neck. But with every step I took, the light seemed to brighten. It was pulsing, alive, like it had its own heartbeat, which oddly was perfectly in sync with my own. Finally, I reached the cabinet. Inside, among the other figurines and artifacts, lay an ancient clay tablet inscribed with symbols I couldn't recognize. Deep in the grooves of the tiny symbols, the tablet pulsed with the blue glow that had caught my eye from the doorway. It wasn't large, barely bigger than the size of my hand, but it felt alive somehow. The thought quickened my pulse, which seemed to quicken the tablet's pulse as well. Everly? Millie's voice called out from the top of the stairs. Coming! I dashed over to join her, suddenly overwhelmed with guilt. I shouldn't have been poking around. Now I'd probably have nightmares about the living tablet in the basement. It was definitely the start of some poorly written horror movie. Something was likely stirring in its sarcophagus on the other side of the world now. Way to go, Everly. I was breathless when I reached her at the top of the stairs. Millie tilted her head and glanced over my shoulder down the staircase. Everything okay down there? Yep, fine. I smiled too broadly. She stared at me silently for a moment, then must have decided it wasn't important enough to pursue any further. Well, I had a look, and that is definitely a painting of you. No one else has eyes like that. Sure they do. It's a condition called heterochromia iridium, I argued. Plus, if he got such precise details as my eyes, why didn't he include my scar? I gestured to the obvious raised line under my lip. It's kind of hard to miss. Hmm. Millie made the same noise my mom had when I pointed out the scar to her earlier. It was one of the rare moments when I actually remembered they were twins. Other than their terribly outdated names, Mildred and Matilda, or Millie and Tilly for short, there really wasn't many similarities between them. Millie craved the spotlight. She loved to be the center of attention. She lived extravagantly in a townhome in the Upper East Side of Manhattan worth some ridiculous number of millions of dollars. My mom, on the other hand, was a simple woman, She'd moved me out to the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, after my dad left us when I was just a baby. She said she was tired of people, tired of the negativity in the world. So she set us up on our own plot of land, complete with a half-acre garden, orchard, cattle, horses, chickens, and a pot-belly pig named Chorizo. Physically, they may have looked alike fresh out of the shower— But Millie was always done up with perfect makeup, hair, and nails, while my mom preferred jeans, boots, and a ponytail. Both were beautiful in their own way. They had the same hearty laugh, the same quick wit, and the same clever gleam in their gorgeous crystalline eyes. Somehow those jeans had missed me. I took more after my dad, whoever he was. A flutter of white caught my attention, just in time to see the same little white owl from earlier in the day land on the edge of a window frame. Hey, little guy. A lot has happened since I last saw you. Sorry to tell you your owners have gone. Are you talking to that owl? Nilly asked, eyes wide. Yeah, we met earlier. Are you kidding me? She squeezed my upper arm. Ouch! Yes, I'm just kidding. What is it with you two and owls? Your mom saw it too? Of course, I shrugged. Wait, you're not scared of it, are you? Scared? Oh, 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 no. Well, she shifted uncomfortably. Yeah, no, I'm not scared of it, but did it? Never mind. 
Millie, what is going on? She chewed her bottom lip, deliberating before finally speaking again. It's not the owl I'm afraid of, okay? It's what the owl stands for. Is this one of those old wives' tales? What was it? If you hear an owl hoot during the day, it means death is coming. Was that it? It's not an old wives' tale. Folklore, myth, whatever it is, this sweet little guy doesn't mean us any harm, do you, buddy? I walked over to the window, and surprisingly, the owl didn't fly away. One man's myth is another man's history, Millie said. What? I looked back over my shoulder to see if she was serious. Don't talk to the owl. Get in the car. It's time to go. Chapter 7 Millie's driver waited patiently for us by the curb, wearing navy blue slacks and a crisp white shirt. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man with a youthful, boyish face. He moved to open the back door when he saw us emerge from the gallery. The driver's side door of the police car opened at the same time. Did you find what you were looking for, miss? The officer sauntered out of the vehicle, his gait clumsy and uncomfortable, like he had sweat running down the back of his pants and he was trying to avoid getting wet. He spoke to Millie, even though I was the one looking for something. She didn't, but that's okay. We really must get on our way. Millie's patience was gone. Her flirty grin was replaced with unease. That owl must have really gotten to her. Well, tell you what, I'm going to give you my number here. You give me a call if you need to get back in or if there is ever anything else I might be able to help you with. He flashed his yellow teeth again, and it took everything I had not to laugh in his face. Millie was way out of his league. She was out of everyone's league. She'd never married or even dated anyone that I could remember. Or if you want, I can call you if I find whatever it is you're missing. No, no, that's quite all right. She accepted the paper with his number written on it. I'll keep this handy. Thank you again, officer. Any time, he grinned. I like to serve. He would like to serve you anyway. Me? He doesn't have time to help me. I mumbled as I climbed into the waiting sedan. Millie's driver chuckled and closed the door behind me. Where to? He asked as he slid into his seat. Just take us home, please, Jeeves. Jeeves? The name fell out of my mouth before I could stop myself. I hadn't heard him say more than a couple of words, but he certainly didn't sound like a Jeeves. The driver laughed again, his tone warm and kind. That's what I asked her to call me. He glanced over his shoulder with a twinkle in his eye. His voice was rich and thick, with the syrupy southern drawl. She wouldn't let me wear a tux, so I said I at least had to get a cool name if this deal was gonna work. I see, I grinned at him. He was probably just five or six years older than me, Definitely not the stereotypical New York City driver. Then again, there was nothing stereotypical about Millie's life. I glanced over at her. She was chewing her lip and staring nervously out the window, so I turned my focus back to Jeeves instead. So, tell me who you were before you became Jeeves the tuxless driver. He laughed again, and his joy was infectious. I couldn't help but smile along with him. Well, my mama calls me Brian, but there's a million Brians in the world. There ain't too many Jeeves. I moved up here a few years ago after I graduated from college. I had big dreams, still do. Not that I don't love being Millie's driver. It's just that I've always wanted to be under the lights and preferably on a stage instead of on a field. Though I did love them Friday night lights. He quieted for a moment, reminiscing. But it turns out they don't have too many parts available on Broadway for Alabama linebackers, so here I am driving instead. Do you like it? Shoot, yeah, I do. And I couldn't ask for a better boss than Millie. She's got finer tastes than all the ladies in the Birmingham Junior League combined. Just wait till you try this cheese we picked up. I heard about the cheese, and I'm honestly not sure if you can live up to the hype. 
I have a pretty high bar for... My voice trailed off as I watched a group of pedestrians migrate through the crosswalk in front of our car. Dusk was making an appearance as the sun moved behind the skyline, so the people were just as illuminated by the city's lights as they were the sun. But even through the neon blues and pinks, those golden eyes were unmistakable, especially because they were staring straight through the windshield at me. Millie, I nudged my aunt. Do you see that guy in the blue shirt in front of us? Which one? She directed her eyes to the front of our vehicle. Tate winked at me, flashed his crooked grin, and moved further into the mass of bodies. Right there, the guy who just winked at me. She squinted and cocked her head to the side. Sorry, Ev, I didn't see. What about him? Nothing, I guess. He was at the gallery with us earlier, but I don't suppose he would have seen anything either. I chewed at the edge of my thumbnail, a nervous habit I'd never quite been able to kick. No, probably not, and I've been thinking about that. Did your mom say anything to you this afternoon? Anything different? Different from what? She sighed. I don't know. Just out of the ordinary. Anything that might have sounded a little strange? Everything she did was strange this afternoon. She did say she had something to tell me. She tried a few times, but I think she was literally worried sick. She nearly vomited every time she spoke. She tried to write something down, but all I got was an A and a T before the seizure started. Oh. Oh, my. Okay. This is... Okay. Millie began fanning herself with her hand. What is it, Millie? I feel like I have no idea what is going on today. She ignored my question, fanning frantically and staring out the window again. I'm out of the loop, I said, with a dramatic shrug that ended with my hands slapping down on my knees. It's a lot like Becca Harrison's birthday party in the sixth grade, when I had tissue paper sticking out of my bra and no one thought to tell me about it. Everybody knew it but me. I thought I was getting away with looking mature and cool. Nope. I was the fool. They all just giggled at their little secret while I was left clueless and embarrassed at the end of the night. Jeeves chuckled from the front seat. Dang, that's rough. Becca Harrison sounds like a real brat. You know what? She is a brat, Jeeves. Thank you for that. I turned to my aunt. Are you being a brat too, Millie? Are you hiding a secret that's going to leave me embarrassed at the end of the night? I would never try to embarrass you. That's not what I asked. I ground my teeth, frustrated and getting nowhere. Jeeves rolled to a stop in front of my aunt's mega-million-dollar townhouse. I didn't actually know what it cost, but my guess probably wasn't too far off. I pulled the car door handle and stepped out before Jeeves had a chance to get to me. My eyes glazed over the six-story limestone facade of Millie's home. We were less than a block from Fifth Ave and Central Park, yet the exterior of her spot in the city felt cozy and charming. It wasn't farmhouse-in-the-middle-of-nowhere kind of homey, but still nicer than one might expect living in the largest city in the United States. She stepped onto the sidewalk, pausing beside me as Jeeves shuffled inside with a bag carrying the famed cheese. Once he disappeared through the brass doors at the entrance, she leaned over and whispered, though she didn't make eye contact. All right, I've decided it's time we let you in on the secret. Oh? Color me intrigued. I tried to play down the sarcasm in my tone, but I was getting a little fed up with this nonsense. If this secret could help me figure out what happened to my mom, she should have told me the minute I called her. Millie inhaled deeply, then finally turned to face me. Have you ever heard of Atlantis? The lost continent under the sea? Yes. There wasn't an ounce of humor on her face. Uh, yeah. What about it? She cleared her throat. That's where we're from your mother and me. I believe she was trying to tell you that she is Atlantean, 
and to some degree you may be as well. She marched up the steps and through the doorway, leaving me slack-jawed on the sidewalk alone. Chapter 8 I scurried through the door after Millie, only to be nearly plowed over by one of the giant beasts who lived with her. Lemon drop, sit! Millie wagged a finger at the English mastiff, who leaned its two-hundred-pound body against my thigh. Another set of gargantuan dog feet galloped across the herringbone wooden floors of Millie's foyer. Look out! Here comes Tiny Tim! Miraculously, the other dog was even larger than the first. Tiny Tim ran to greet me, his loose, slobbery jowls swinging with each bound until his squishy, wet face smushed right into my gut. Oof! Tiny, no! Millie huffed. Sorry, they're just so happy to see you. Oh, I'm happy to see you guys, too, I scratched Tiny's head. But I can't play right now. I have something very serious to discuss with my aunt, who is currently walking away from me. Millie, hang on. You can't drop a sentence like that and then just walk away. What did you mean by... Shh. She turned around in the doorway to the kitchen and shot me a stern look. Not now. Not now, but we have guests coming over for dinner. They'll probably be here any minute now. I pushed past Tiny Tim and Lemon Drop to follow Millie into her extraordinary kitchen. Her private chef was hard at work preparing hors d'oeuvres as Jeeves pulled the expensive cheese from its packaging and placed it on the marble countertop. It's about time, the chef said in an unmistakably French accent. What took you so long? Sorry, Pierre, we had to stop for Everly. We're probably going to be one person short tonight, too. Only four plates, not five, unless you see my sister arrive. Millie cut her eyes briefly to me and pressed her lips together. Oh, Pierre dramatically placed the back of his hand against his forehead. Always we see changes. I muffled a giggle at the sight of her distraught chef, then refocused on my aunt. Maybe we can go up and prepare the dining room. I shifted my eyes up to the second floor, where her formal dining room was likely already set and decorated beyond my wildest dreams. Millie wasn't a last-minute kind of person, but still, I needed to get her alone so we could talk. She frowned and subtly shook her head. So much for that plan. I crossed my arms over my chest. It was so not cool for her to keep me waiting. And the Atlantis thing was obviously a joke, right? I mean, it didn't exist. But then again, yesterday I might have said the owl, the painting, and the glowing stone tablet couldn't possibly be real either. I didn't know what to believe anymore. The doorbell chimed a cheerful little riff from a Scottish jig. They're here! Millie grinned and clapped her hands together. I followed her back into the grand foyer, doing my best to keep the mastiffs at bay while Millie opened the door. Claudia! My aunt exchanged side-to-side -side air kisses with the petite brunette. Claudia was curvy, and ruffles lining the back of her seafoam green floor-length cardigan only drew more attention to her hips. She wore thigh-high black patent boots with spiked heels to add slightly to her height. Her lips were stained a crimson red, her makeup just as perfect as Millie's. They admired each other's outfits before scuttling further inside like a couple of giggling schoolgirls. It was only then that I noticed Claudia's son. He was lean and wiry, handsome as I'd expected, but not in a traditional sense— his hair was a dark auburn, the reddish hue only visible under the lights, and light freckles dotted his nose. His eyes were quite striking, green like the bay. He shoved his hands into his pockets, shoulders tight as he surveyed the room. Landing on me, he offered an apologetic grin. Everly, this is my friend Claudia, and this, she gestured proudly to the boy behind them, is Sean. He'll be starting college this year, too, at Columbia. 
She dipped her chin for emphasis, already insinuating that I, too, should be attending Columbia. How could she be thinking about my college choices right now? My mother was missing, and she just implied that we may be a part of a mythical race of humans. I'm so sorry we're late, Claudia said. No apologies necessary. Millie started up the grand staircase that led to the second floor. We all stepped into line behind her, Sean bringing up the rear, and Lemon Drop bounding ahead to the front. You haven't missed a thing. She paused and turned back toward us with a conspiratorial glint in her pale blue eyes. I was just telling Everly about her Atlantean background. Wonderful, Claudia said brightly. Then it sounds like we're just in time. Sean glanced at me with pity in his eyes as he passed me on the stairs. My feet froze in place. Tiny Tim paused beside me, licking my hand with his foamy pink tongue while I watched the others ascend the stairs before me. Is this for real? I asked the dog quietly. Thankfully, he didn't respond. With a day like this, I wouldn't have been all that surprised if he had. Chapter 9 Everyone was already seated when I entered Millie's dining room. She and Claudia chatted casually about some upcoming fundraiser, while Sean sat opposite them, staring down at his napkin. The only other place setting at the table was right beside him. Thanks a lot, Millie. He looked up as I pulled out the chair next to him, feigning nonchalance. So, when did you arrive in New York? I had to commend his effort in trying to make me feel comfortable. Any other day it might have worked, but I wasn't in the mood for small talk. It boggled my mind that these people could mention something like descending from Atlantis with such flippancy and move on to dull topics like travel itineraries. Ignoring his question, I sat down with a huff and pinned him with my glare. Is this some kind of practical joke? Because I don't think it's funny. I've had kind of a rough day. The women stopped their conversation and turned to listen. I, uh, I don't know about any jokes. No one is joking here. He looked nervously toward his mother for help. She just smiled and gestured for him to continue. So what my aunt said about... I swallowed, rethinking my plan. Perhaps they'd thought she said Atlantan. I could be from Georgia. That was much more reasonable than a sunken continent that didn't exist. What I said about you being born from the people of Atlantis. Millie filled in my blank with an encouraging nod. Okay, so lost continent it is. Right, I'm going to need more of an explanation. Millie's young housemaid arrived then with four dinner salads. They were topped with blue cheese and candied pecans and admittedly looked really delicious. My hot dog from earlier was long forgotten. We all paused our conversation while the maid was in the room, but the moment she left, I raised my brows expectantly at my aunt. She needed to get to talking. This is delightful, Claudia said. What is this dressing? It's a vinaigrette Pierre makes from scratch. I think it's... I loudly cleared my throat. Millie and Claudia both turned to me with the reprimanding looks of a mother. I didn't care if I was being rude. They were, too. We can talk about salads later. I have been really patient. My speech was slow, carefully enunciating every syllable. It was a true practice of patience. I need to know what you're talking about now. You say you're from Atlantis, but surely you can't be referring to the Atlantis. There is only one. Will you please elaborate? Millie placed her fork on the table next to her plate. This world, she gestured broadly, is more than it seems. You have grown up with the humans in a very one-dimensional view of life— but beyond your perception, there is another world. An immortal world, Claudia chimed in. Immortal? 
I nearly choked on my lettuce. Are you saying you've been around since the beginning of time? And mom? No, dear, not exactly. But my soul has. It's difficult to explain. All right, talk to me like I'm five. Start at the very beginning. Where is Atlantis? Millie sighed, pausing as though she were trying to decide where to begin. Plato's writings of Atlantis are true, mostly. We were once a great nation, powerful and advanced. We were placed here to protect the humans, and we served our purpose well. Placed here? So you're like guardian angels? Of course not. The angels and demons are in a whole other realm. They usually stay there and leave us to watch over this one. It's our job to make sure mankind doesn't destroy itself before the battle is complete in the spiritual realm. We are not angels. We are called keepers. Keepers. I chewed on that for a moment. Keepers of the earth. Land, sky, and sea, to be precise. Millie took another bite of her salad. Okay, so you're keepers with immortal souls placed here to protect the humans, but you still haven't told me where Atlantis is. Well, it used to be in the Mediterranean Sea, she said bitterly, but our ancestors went and ruined that for us about 12,000 years ago. They got a little too big for their britches, Claudia added. So now it's at the bottom of the Atlantic. The maid entered again, removing our salad dishes and replacing them with dinner plates. The scent of individual stuffed Cornish hens danced across my palate, making my mouth water. Once the maid left, I spoke again. Legend says the gods created some kind of cataclysm that destroyed Atlantis. Is that true? Ha! Huh. They wish they were gods— Claudia cut into her meal. Humans didn't know what to make of us, Millie said. They recognized that we were more powerful than they, so they assumed we were gods, or half-human, half-god. But they were obviously wrong. We are just a different type of being altogether. So you destroyed yourselves? That didn't make sense. No. We got into it with some of the other keepers— Tensions were mounting between the three races, and unfortunately, our ancestors enjoyed being thought of as gods by the humans. They took things too far, so the other keepers had to take matters into their own hands. Checks and balances, Claudia added through a mouthful of food. So there are three races of keepers? Yes, my apologies. It's been a century since I've had to review the history with someone. I forget that you were brought up as a human. There are the Atlanteans, that's us, the keepers of the sea. There are the Olympians, the keepers of the sky. And there are the Agarthians, keepers of the land. We were supposed to work together, but even keepers are susceptible to corruption. And egos, especially those Olympians, they're still on a power trip. Claudia rolled her eyes. There's been a rift between the three races for thousands of years. We generally don't associate with one another anymore, except for the annual Order of the Keepers Convention. But we each have important roles to play in protecting the humans, and there are laws we must abide by, which brings me back to your mother. A pang of guilt stabbed at me. I'd been so caught up in the outrageous story of Keepers that I'd temporarily forgotten the reason I wanted to learn more in the first place. Right, my law-abiding Atlantean mother. Are you suggesting she's gone on some human-saving mission? No, I'm afraid not. Millie rested her fork and frowned. The others stopped eating as well, all eyes fixed on me. She may be on the other side of the law, your mother didn't exactly play by the rules. What do you mean? My pulse picked up. Mom always played by the rules. I couldn't imagine what the Atlanteans might have disagreed with. Well, Claudia spoke now. She had you. 
Chapter 10 Me? Why is that a crime? Are you not allowed to have children? What about him? I pointed harshly toward Sean, who raised both hands innocently in the air. Of course we can have children, it's just that... Claudia shifted uncomfortably in her chair. It's just that there are rules. You mentioned that. What did she do wrong? We can't prove that she did anything wrong. Millie set her lips and turned with a pointed stare toward her friend. Claudia gestured toward me, but my aunt waved her off. We don't know anything for sure just yet. Millie softened her expression and faced me again. Our kind, the Keepers, have immortal souls, as we mentioned earlier. Our bodies last longer than human bodies as well. We'll often live for close to a thousand years before our bodies give out, and when that happens, our souls are reincarnated. They are a finite number of keepers, a finite number of souls. So your souls are basically recycled over and over again. Got it. Does that mean you remember life on Atlantis before it was destroyed? It was an unimportant question, but I couldn't help but ask. If Atlantis was real, I wanted to know everything there was to know about it. No. Unfortunately, we are unable to keep specific memories. But our collective knowledge as a race grows with each successive generation. And there are certain ties, bonds, that can be felt in every generation. The most obvious being our soulmates. You see, every Atlantean soul is bonded to another— and in each life, the souls find one another. Millie smiled, though her eyes looked pained. I imagine she may have been thinking of her own soulmate. Or did she have one at all? Claudia scowled, interrupting Millie. So if an Atlantean has a relationship that results in children with someone from a different species, like, I don't know, humans, for example, then we lose a couple of Atlantean souls— a half-human vessel can't contain a full keeper soul. I couldn't help but feel a little guilty under her gaze. So the souls just disappear? My voice was more timid now. Forever, Millie nodded sadly. A female keeper can physiologically only have two children in her lifetime. If even one of those children is part human... A soul is lost, possibly two souls, depending on the genetics. What do you mean? Well, the child may have the soul of a keeper if she takes completely after her mother. She may have the soul of a human if she takes completely after her father. Millie frowned, and her eyes went distant, lost in a thought she couldn't utter aloud. Or she may be fractured which is what usually happens. Sean, of all people, had to finish my aunt's words. The women were too distraught, staring down into their laps. What happens to the fractured souls? My voice was barely a whisper now. Sean locked his eyes on mine, deep green pools of pity. I held his gaze, the silence in the room snuffing out my ability to look away. Never you mind that. Millie grinned, snapping back to the present. She tried to improve the mood with overt cheerfulness and failed. We weren't a very cheery bunch at all in that moment. The maid entered once again, taking my plate before I'd had a chance to finish off my wild rice. I almost objected, but I needed her to leave again so I could get the rest of the story. It seemed they were accusing my mother of hooking up with a mortal— but I would need to hear them say it before I believed it, and I feared what the implications may be if it were true. A giant slice of turtle cheesecake was placed in front of me next. I resisted the urge to dig right in. First, I needed my aunt to confirm my suspicions, and then I needed to find out how to bail my mom out of Atlantean jail for getting involved with my deadbeat human dad and literally creating some poor lost soul. Even as I thought the words, doubt clouded my mind. 
My mother wasn't the type to break rules, especially not rules with such dire consequences. Finally, the maid retreated with our dirty plates and we were free to speak again. Okay, I said, so let's get to the elephant in the room and talk about my dad. Yes, let's. Claudia crossed her arms and shot a smug look at my aunt. But Millie handled the situation with grace. This is where things get tricky. Your mother ran away when she found out she was pregnant with you. None of us knew she was in a relationship at all, and when we asked her about it, she panicked and left. It took us years to locate her, and even then, we were only able to do so with the help of a seer. We found your farm in Oklahoma, but you and your mother lived there alone. Tilly refused to discuss your father. She would get physically ill any time we pressed her on the matter. I think it was a curse, personally. I think she has been forbidden to speak of your father, which makes me believe he is a very powerful Atlantean indeed. Or, Claudia butted in, what's more likely is that your father is immortal. Tilly would never reveal that information because she'd have to face the courts, and they do not take kindly to the murderers of our souls. I cringed. My mother a murderer? Surely not. So that brings us to you. You're 18 now, right, Everly? Claudia fixed her blue eyes on me. That's right. And you have not developed your powers yet. It was a statement rather than a question. Powers? See, Claudia sneered at my aunt. Millie sighed. There are certain perks that come with being a keeper— we have abilities beyond what humans are capable of, and generally, they begin to manifest between the ages of 16 and 18, but sometimes there are late bloomers. I swallowed. What kind of powers are we talking about here? They vary through the different races, and even within the Atlanteans they can manifest in many different ways. I am a healer, the Olympian who helped us locate your mother was a seer. There are warriors, elementals, transporters, guardians, sirens, shifters. She counted them off on her fingers, each one sounding more exotic than the one before. What kind of powers does my mom have? Your mother was a messenger. Was? Yes. She had her powers bound when she ran away— she gave them up for you, in an attempt to stay hidden. Sadness glistened at Millie's lower lids. I'd never seen my aunt cry. I didn't even know if Atlanteans could cry, but this was as close to losing control of her perfect features as I'd ever seen her. Whatever powers came with being a messenger, my mother had sacrificed them. For me. But why? If I were Atlantean, there would be no need to give up her powers and hide. The longer I sat there, the more I conceded that Claudia may be right. I wasn't pure. I was mortal. As though she could see the thoughts percolating through my mind, Millie continued, trying her best to prove that there was still a chance my mother hadn't broken the rules, that she hadn't lost an Atlantean soul. But there are certain commonalities among all keepers, one of which is a higher level of intelligence, and you, Everly, have an IQ much higher than humans, which is why I'm certain you must be of Atlantean descent on both sides. She crossed her arms and turned toward Claudia with a self-satisfied smile, like she'd just won a big court case. I'm sorry, Millie, but that's just not true. She could have easily inherited her intelligence from her mother, even if her father was mortal. And without any other powers, I'm inclined to believe that is exactly what has happened. Both women fixed their eyes on me, waiting to see if I could settle their argument. I could memorize facts and take tests like a boss, but that didn't seem all that special. I would never say anything to condemn my mother or the decisions she made, though. Surely there was something I did better than everyone else? Is snarkiness a superpower? 
Millie groaned and Claudia frowned. I turned toward Sean, but he wouldn't make eye contact with me. He seemed hesitant to jump into the conversation again. I couldn't blame him. This was awkward for all of us. There's still time. She's only just turned 18 this summer. There's no need to rush into anything, including having my sister tried for a crime she may not have committed. So if you know who has taken her, I really must urge you to have them return her. She eyed Claudia with suspicion heavy in her eyes. I told you on the phone earlier. Peter said he has heard nothing about your sister. If the council sent for her, he would have known about it. And as for Everly, you better hope she's fully Atlantean, because if she's as smart as you say, then she's not purely mortal and... Claudia bit her lip to stop herself from saying any more. Unless I get some power soon, that would mean I have a fractured soul, I finished her thought. The entire room seemed to darken at my words. Silence hung in the air for longer than was comfortable. It was Lemon Drop who finally broke it with a small whine. I'll let her out, I said. I could use a breath of fresh air right now, too. Chapter 11 My steps were quiet as I slowly led the dogs out of the dining room, but once I hit the stairs, I took off hard and fast, my feet pounding every other step as I sped down to the first floor. Pierre was a blur as I bounded past the kitchen toward the small courtyard off the back of Millie's townhouse. The cool evening air was a relief for my senses. The air back home would have been hot and muggy, even after the sun went down. I would have relaxed on my back patio and heard the song of cicadas while watching a show of lightning bugs dancing through the air. In NYC, however, I had chill bumps dotting my bare arms in the August evening air. My cicadas were replaced with the sounds of Manhattan nightlife, and my lightning bugs were replaced with streetlights. But the outside air was a relief all the same. Lemon Drop and Tiny Tim were a little worked up. They'd taken my speedy run down the stairs as a signal for playtime. Not now, I said, trying to calm them with open hands. Go potty. I directed them to the itty-bitty green area designated as their toilet at the back of Millie's first-floor outdoor space. They spun excitedly, still under the impression that I was going to throw them a tennis ball or something equally fun. You're right, I said. Lemon Drop sat and turned her head sideways. We're only a block from the park. Let's go. Back inside, I leashed the dogs up and hollered something to Pierre about taking the dogs for a walk. I didn't fear the New York streets like the other girls from back home. In middle of nowhere Oklahoma, we didn't lock doors. We left keys in our cars and didn't even knock before strolling into each other's homes. In comparison, New York was a scary place for them. They'd spewed warnings and stories and words of caution before I left for school here. But I wasn't afraid. It never bothered me too much. And even if it had, I wasn't the least bit nervous with 400 pounds of dog on my sides. Millie only lived a short walk away from Central Park, so I wouldn't be long anyway. With leashes wrapped around each fist, my canine companions and I set out for wide open spaces, or as wide and open as we could get in the city. Locating a paved path, I turned into the park, allowing the dogs to lead me. They'd been here way more than I ever had, so I figured I'd let them take the reins. They weaved off to the right in tandem, as though they visited the area daily. Lights were more sparse here than where we'd entered, and there were fewer people meandering around. A lone jogger passed us on the sidewalk, and then we were alone. All right, guys, hurry up and go so we can get back home. The longer I stood watching them sniff the ground, the more uncomfortable I became with my surroundings. Darn those Oklahoma girls for getting into my head. The dogs continued to sniff and circle, marking various spots as we walked. They may have stayed in the park all night if I'd let them, but I'd had enough. With a gentle tug on their leashes, I called them back. 
Tiny Tim turned, tongue lolling over the side of his slobbery mouth. With an extra bit of pep, he bounded toward me. I held out my hand to praise him with a pat on the head, but he didn't stop. He kept right on past me, spinning me around with a leash in my hand. I spotted him again behind me, running right up to the tall, dark silhouette of a man. Oh my goodness, I gasped. The figure strode slowly toward me, shadow still hiding his hooded face. Tiny Tim didn't appear to be concerned, but he was such a gentle giant that he wouldn't recognize danger if it knocked him on the head, and this danger was just close enough to do that. Lemon Drop joined them now, too. Watch out, they bite! I made my voice loud and as imposing as I could, but still the figure persisted. I stepped back, tugging at the dog's leash with every step the man made toward me. Finally, I entered a ring of yellow light from a street lamp. It cast a long shadow in front of me, leading right up to the feet of the hooded man. He stepped forward once, twice, and the light struck his shadowy features on the third step. He pulled down the hood of his gray sweatshirt, revealing the sharp, chiseled lines of his handsome face. What on earth are you doing in Central Park by yourself after dark? My breath released with a whoosh as I looked into those golden eyes twinkling in the light. I'm not by myself. I have my guard dogs with me. They're pretty ineffective guard dogs, he said, scratching a very happy tiny behind the ears. What are you doing here, Tate? The absurdity of running into the same person three times in one day hit me. That, combined with my still racing heartbeat, made my words sound harsher than I'd intended. I was out for a run. His clothing checked out, but still it was strange. Something told me this wasn't just a coincidence. Everly! Sean's voice called out from the darkness, and Lemon Drop tugged excitedly to go meet him. Two guys calling for my attention at the same time? If only middle school Everly could see me now. Over here, I called back. Tate shoved his hands into the pockets of his joggers and raised his brows. Sorry, I didn't realize you were out with your boyfriend. He's not my boyfriend. My cheeks flushed at his insinuation. Or was he simply trying to determine whether or not I was available? We just met tonight. He's the son of a family friend. Sean finally reached us, approaching with some apprehension. Your aunt's looking for you. His frown morphed into a scowl as he took in Tate's form across from us. First Mom, then Sean. Poor Tate couldn't catch a break. Who knew it was such a hardship to be so beautiful? They hated him on sight. Do you know this guy? Sean gave me a skeptical look. Sort of. We met at the gallery earlier. Sean's eyes widened. He turned again to examine Tate, who stood patiently with a half-smirk, still petting Millie's dog. We need to get back to the house, he said. Then to Tate he added, Whatever you're looking for, this isn't it. What was that supposed to mean? Somewhere behind us in the shadows of the park, an owl hooted. Tate crossed his arms and raised his chin a fraction of an inch. No, I think it is. Everly, you need to stay away from this guy. Sean narrowed his eyes. Why? Tate stepped closer to me, sliding his arm casually across the back of my shoulders. The warmth of his touch sent a buzzing feeling down my spine. I wanted to curl in closer and feel his arms wrap around me. We'd only just met, yet I felt comfortable with Tate, protected, safe. Why would she want to do that? We're friends, aren't we, Everly? I tilted my head slightly to look up at his face, my heart pounding in my chest. I met his golden gaze with a lazy grin. Friends? Heck yes, I wanted to be his friend. Everly? Everly? I snapped my eyes back to a very irritated Sean. Come on. His patience was growing thin. 
Tate curled his fingers around the edge of my shoulder, and I leaned into him ever so slightly. I didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted to be right here. You go ahead, I said. Tell Millie I'll meet up with you guys soon. Sean huffed and walked to a grassy area beside the sidewalk, shaking his head. He picked up a stick and waved it in front of the dogs. Then, with a wide swing of his arms, he launched it. Go get it, he shouted. The dogs lunged forward, yanking me from Tate's warm body. I tripped and stumbled, but somehow managed to stay on my feet as I chased the dogs, their leashes still wrapped tightly around my hands. A moment later, Lemon Drop emerged victorious, the stick dangling from her droopy dog lips. I turned around to see the boys face to face, chests puffed up like a couple of roosters. They were several yards away now, and I couldn't make out what they were saying, but it looked like one of them might slug the other at any moment. Why were they so defensive? Or better yet, why had I been so reluctant to leave Tate? With some distance between us once again, I realized how foolish it would have been for me to stay behind. I still didn't really know him. Sean, I called. I'm ready now. Let's get back. Hang on. Tate shouted with a frown. He dropped his glare from Sean and jogged over to me. The sight of him running casually over sent another flight of butterflies in my belly. Could he actually be interested in me? I'd always thought love at first sight was just for fairy tales, but maybe, if he was feeling just as woozy around me as I was around him, perhaps this wasn't so foolish after all. Maybe it was meant to be. Don't touch her, Sean yelled, running quickly after him. The dogs were getting excited again with all the activity. They wanted to play, and it did look like it was all fun and games at first, but no one was having fun after Sean lost his temper. With surprising swiftness, his heavy fist rose and echoed a dull whack as it collided into Tate's perfect nose. Chapter 12 What are you doing? I'm protecting you. That's my job. Sean shook out his hand. Are you okay? I rushed over to Tate, who rubbed his jawline, the shadow of a smirk still tugging at the corner of his mouth. I'm fine, but let's get you out of here. This guy has lost it. I prepared to walk away with him. We didn't need that kind of violence in our lives. It was only common sense— Tate made me feel happy and giddy inside. Sean made me feel grumpy, and apparently he had a violent streak. Don't do it, Everly. Sean's tone was menacing. He's messing with you. I looked back and forth between the two. Yesterday, they'd been strangers to me. Today, they both urged me to leave the other behind, and they were literally fighting over who I should leave with. Why? Why would either one give two licks about me? Ignore him. Tate reached out and gently rubbed his thumb down the side of my cheek. I practically purred under his touch, forgetting my suspicions from a mere three seconds earlier. Then he was jerked away from me again with a giant shove from Sean. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? I told you he's messing with you. You've fallen for his glamour. He's a siren. Sean pointed an accusing finger at Tate. Glamour? He... Wh what? I turned to see a stone-faced Tate glaring back at him. Then he turned his cold gaze on me. The warmth from his eyes was gone, replaced with something much more sinister. I shivered and ran my hands up and down the sides of my arms. Are you saying that he's... Like us? Us? That confirms it, Tate sneered. He reached out for my wrist, but this time, Tiny Tim stepped between us, letting out a deep, rumbling growl that stopped him in his tracks. Good boy, Sean said, patting the dog. See, even the animals recognize you for what you are. Leave her alone. You know I can't do that. Tate crossed his arms. Now that I know what she is... I can't leave her alone. I can't return unless I've got her with me. You don't know what she is. 
None of us do yet. You can't take her if she's pure. So I suggest you wipe that arrogant grin from your face and run along now. Or what? Tate stepped up to Sean, daring him to hit him again. She's not pure. Look at her. His lip rolled up in disgust as his eyes scanned up and down my lanky frame. Ouch. So much for love at first sight. I was such an idiot. He stood six inches taller than Sean, but something about the way my new friend held himself made me want to put my money on Sean. He was scrappy. If I didn't fear him damaging Tate's gorgeous face, I might have even liked to see them duke it out. Then again, now that I knew Tate's gorgeous face was manipulating me and toying with my emotions, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to see it busted up a little bit after all, especially if he was trying to kidnap me, as Sean implied. Touch her, and the hunter will become the hunted, Sean said after a silent stare down. I held in a snort. He was being a little melodramatic in my opinion, but it worked. Tate's eyes flashed with fury. You know what happens if you hunt a mortal. Tate's lip curled. I'm still not convinced she's mortal either, and the fractured must be dealt with. You know that as well as I do. I shook my head emphatically, pushing my hands out in front of myself and flipping them over, as if there was some kind of evidence to prove to him that I was as human as the next girl. Totally mortal. See? I'm not fractured. Neither boy glanced in my direction. They were too focused on being the more intimidating man, or whatever kind of beings they were. And maybe that was a good thing. I didn't want to get my mother into deeper trouble by admitting that I was mortal. But I definitely wasn't immortal. Ugh, there was no way to win here. I'm going to report you, Sean said at last. I dare you to draw attention to her. Go ahead. They'll execute her mother and then turn her over to me anyway. She may be pure, Sean insisted again, through tightly gritted teeth, practically hissing his words. I'll believe it when I see it. Tate winked and blew a kiss in my direction. And I will be seeing more of you, darling. He turned on his heels and jogged off into the shadows. Tiny's hackles were still raised. I calmed the dog and looked up at Sean, who was still fuming in the low light of the street lamp. Well, that was interesting, I said. I gather he's a keeper? Sean shifted his steely gaze to me, and I shrugged. I mean, I'm not interested in keeping him. I meant like the being, like you guys. Obviously, I wouldn't want to keep someone who tried to glamour and kidnap me, or at least I don't think so. Explain glamour to me, because if it's what I'm thinking of, like a fairy. You didn't mention that you'd run into an Agarthian during your story earlier. Sean interrupted my nervous rambling. Is there anything else you conveniently forgot to mention? Agarthian? I wanted to argue that I didn't even know what that meant a few hours ago, but Sean definitely wasn't in the mood to argue about the minutia. I told them about the painting earlier, but I didn't mention the tablet. Something told me it was sacred. It wasn't something to casually toss out in conversation. Could I trust him to help me figure out what it meant without reporting anything back to his mother? It really felt like we were on the cusp of figuring out what happened to my mom. She wasn't taken by the Atlantean authorities, according to Claudia. But Tate and the Agarthians didn't seem to be involved with her either. He had his sights set on me. Maybe the tablet was linked to her disappearance somehow. It was the only stone we'd left unturned, no pun intended. Ultimately, I didn't have a choice. It wasn't written in a language I understood, but perhaps an Atlantean could. I just hoped he could keep it between us. There was one other thing, I said under my breath. Yeah, what? Sean's face was still cold but I saw curiosity flash behind his jade eyes. I appraised him again. I'm not sure if it's something I can explain. Can I show you? He took a step back and raised his hands. Is it something that's going to get us in trouble? I shrugged. It might, but it might also help me find my mom. 
He scratched the back of his head and glanced around the empty park. Finally, he sighed. All right, lead the way. Chapter 13 So tell me what exactly happened back there. I passed Tiny Tim's leash to Sean as we power-walked past my aunt's street and back toward the gallery. What is there to tell? He shrugged. You were there. I was there, yes, but I have no idea what you and Tate were talking about. Tate? Sean rolled his eyes with a sarcastic laugh. Thaddeus Castellanos. He's a soul hunter. I tripped on a crack in the sidewalk. Oh, that sounds menacing. It is, for you anyway. Because he thinks I'm fractured? Sean wouldn't look at me or acknowledge my question. Evidently, he thought I was some substandard being, just like Tate did. We walked for a few more steps as I considered everything I'd been told about fractured souls. So let's say I am fractured, I began after a bit. Sean looked down at the sidewalk, clearly uncomfortable with the topic. That means I'm neither human nor Atlantean, right? But a mix of both. So will I live for a hundred years, or a thousand? Or somewhere in between, like maybe five hundred? That could be cool. And will I get any powers? Let's hope not, Sean muttered. Hey, I jabbed him playfully in the ribs with my elbow. Don't doubt my abilities before I even get them. I tried to lighten his mood, but nothing worked. He stopped in the middle of the sidewalk. If you get powers, then yes, it means you are fractured. But no, you will not live to see a hundred. You will not live to see nineteen. That's what the soul hunters are for. Soul hunters, I swallowed. Tate's trying to kill me? No, Thaddeus is. That's what they do. The Garthians love to play sirens in the hunter role because they can lure you in with their glamour. They make you feel good, get you alone, and after your walls are down, they convince you to show them your powers. Once they have proof, that's it, you're done. They collect your soul and move on to the next one. He stomped ahead again, leaving me alone on the sidewalk, trying to catch my breath. Wait, I shouted, finally allowing Lemon Drop to pull me back to the boys. Hold on, you're stating this like it's a fact, but I don't have any powers. That's good for you, not so good for your mom. Because then she would be a proven criminal, a murderer. If I were mortal, that would mean my mom would have killed some lost Atlantean soul. Unless... What if my aunt is right? What if mom did hook up with some powerful Atlantean, and she was just too embarrassed to say anything about it? It's possible, right? Maybe I just haven't gotten my powers yet. I doubt it, Sean frowned, and he looked genuinely sad this time. The bond of soulmates is strong. There would be no need to hide their relationship. In fact, if they've bonded enough to conceive a child, it would be nearly impossible to keep them apart. Maybe he died. That would keep them apart. Maybe he was super old when they met, and they could only have me before he passed. I shuddered at the thought of my mom in a relationship with some 900-year-old man. But who was I kidding? I shudder to think of her with any man at all. For as long as I'd been alive, it had just been the two of us. He twisted his mouth to the side, considering it. Unlikely, but not impossible. I thought I saw him nodding softly from the corner of my eye, probably thinking the scenario through. But the gallery was just ahead on the opposite side of the street, and my thoughts were immediately consumed with what we were about to see. I became anxious, excited to get to the tablet again. I wanted to be near it, to touch it. The closer we got, the greater the sensation became. It was like I'd left a piece of myself down there in the basement alone, and we both knew I was about to come back for it. Finally, after what felt like an hour at the crosswalk, we made it to the other side of the street. There were few people out now, so I had a clear view of the metal sign up ahead. There it is, I pointed. Russell and Jude... Huh, 
I've never heard of it. There are probably thousands of galleries in the city you've never heard of, I said, urging Lemon Drop to move more quickly. I hadn't thought the dog part through. We couldn't leave them out on the street. Maybe we could just bring them inside with us. They weren't exactly easy to hide, but at least they were mostly well-behaved. No, I walk this way every day on my route to work. I don't ever recall seeing it here before. Sounds like you need to pay better attention to your surroundings. The glass had been cleaned up from the street, but caution tape still stretched across the windows. I pulled on the door handles, hoping that they were still unlocked, but I'd never been that lucky, and of course the doors didn't budge. Sean gestured toward the window. Let's just climb through. Right, because we're totally discreet with these giant beasts. No one will think twice about a couple of college kids and two English mastiffs climbing through the windows of an expensive art gallery late at night. They probably won't even notice. I rolled my eyes in case a sarcasm in my tone wasn't evident enough on its own. Sean didn't see it, though. He was already halfway through the window after Tiny Tim, who jumped through with a surprising amount of grace. I followed them with a groan. If the cops show up here again, I'm blaming this entirely on you. It's New York. No one cares. We could carry these pieces out one at a time and load them into the back of a stolen, windowless van if we wanted to, and no one would even bat an eye. You say that like you've got experience. Whoa. Sean stopped dead in his tracks. It's this way. I tried to direct him to the basement, but Sean's eyes were locked on one thing and one thing only. The lights were off inside the gallery, and the halls were dark, apart from second-hand light filtering in from the street. But there was one single spotlight, a beacon in the night, drawing all attention toward its prized piece, a four-foot-tall painting of the strong, defiant girl who looked remarkably like me. Chapter 14 Sean tilted his head, admiring the painting as he moved from side to side, taking it in from every angle. It's definitely you. It's not. Look. I pointed to the scar beneath my lip. She's missing this. And if you look closely, there's an intensity in her eyes unlike anything I could ever dream of possessing. Sean agreed. She is much more intimidating than you. But wow, the similarities... If this isn't you, then it's gotta be your identical twin. Wait a minute. I slapped him on the shoulder. Sean, you're a genius. You have a twin? I pointed at the painting. Obviously. He raised a brow. Look at her. She looks just like me, only different, personality-wise. And she's missing the scar... But what if I actually do have an identical twin? Maybe she's living with my long-lost Atlantean father. That would explain everything. Of course my mom would behave strangely if she saw the painting of my twin after 18 years of keeping it a secret. And that would be why I'd never met my father, and why she'd never revealed his identity. He'd probably bound his powers and disappeared just like she had. Visions of the old Parent Trap movie flashed through my mind. If I can just get to summer camp and trade places with this fierce girl, then maybe we can get our parents to fall back in love. I can't deal with you right now. Sean shook his head. Then with a huff, he added, That's not your twin. You can't prove that. It's just as likely that I have a secret twin as it is that some stranger named Rossell coincidentally painted a near-exact likeness of me from the other side of the country. Tell me more about Rossell. You saw him, right? With your mom? Yeah. I went over everything I told him earlier about the white hair and strange mannerisms. I told him about how Rossell knew my mom's nickname, Tilly, and then... Oh, and I think I forgot to mention this earlier, but he said something about an oath. I didn't really register at the time, but I have no idea what kind of oath he was talking about. Interesting. The wheels were really spinning in Sean's brain now, I could tell. Okay, 
Show me whatever this last surprise is. Let's go. The halls grew dark again as we moved away from the painting and back toward the basement door. I thought about pulling out my phone for some illumination, but I'd see light again as soon as we stepped onto the stairs. The tablet was waiting for me. I knew it deep in my bones. I could practically feel it pulsing, emanating the strange blue glow all the way from up here. The dog sat at the top of the stairs, refusing to enter the doorway. I tried to coax them in my best sing-songy voice, but they wouldn't budge. And all the while, the urge to get back to the tablet raged harder and harder. Let's just leave them, I said, getting flustered. They won't go anywhere. After a brief hesitation, Sean agreed and followed me into the narrow stairwell. The dogs' collar rang out with faint jingles as they laid in wait for us at the top of the stairs, and we descended. The blue light became visible almost immediately. I saw it first, but Sean noticed it just a few steps after me. What is that? he asked. This is what I wanted to show you. Once we reached the bottom, the light couldn't be ignored any longer. It pulsed along with my rapidly beating heart, brighter now than it had been during the daylight. Over here! I grabbed Sean's arm and dragged him over to the glass case, a nervous excitement dancing wildly in my belly. There! We stood silently for a moment, watching the light emanating from the ancient text carved into the tablet's surface. It's almost like it's alive. The wonder in Sean's voice matched what I felt. It gets weirder. I took his fingertips and pressed them to the inside of my left wrist. His eyes widened in surprise. I think it's connected to me somehow. I can't explain it, but I know this has something to do with me and maybe my mom. Can you read what it says? Sean frowned. I can try, but it's been several years since I practiced the ancient languages. Where's the latch? We circled the case, looking for a lock or fixture we could open to access the contents, but we came up short. There didn't appear to be any way to get inside it. Sean cursed under his breath. I couldn't give up so easily, though. Even as we stood there, the tablet's call to me grew stronger and stronger. I needed to know what it meant. I paced around the perimeter of the room, searching for some kind of tool I could use to pry the case open, but there wasn't much available. Finally, I settled on a sloppy plan that I would probably come to regret later. Stand back. Why? Wait, Everly! Crash! I slammed a fire extinguisher I'd pulled from the wall right into the wide pane of glass enclosing the tablet. I wasn't large for a girl, but I was strong. I could thank 18 years of farm chores for that. The shards of glass rained down around us, and I waited for some kind of alarm to ring, but there was nothing. It was probably silently alerting the police as we stood there, so we'd have to be quick. I dropped the fire extinguisher and grabbed the tablet. It was smaller and smoother than I'd expected it to be. I ran my hand gingerly over the edges and traced the engraved symbols with my fingertips. Upon closer examination, this looked to be a small part of a larger message. Several of the symbols along the left side were cut off, incomplete. What does it say? I held it out to Sean. He reached for it, but immediately pulled his hand back with a faint sizzle. Ouch! How are you holding that? He shook his hand as though he'd been stung. Did it hurt you? Yes, it's hotter than fire. I rubbed the smooth surface again. It didn't feel hot to me. I don't know. It's not burning me. Here, just take a look. I held it in front of me, close to Sean without touching him. He stepped closer and squinted at the small symbols. I was so focused on the reflection of the blue light in his green eyes that I didn't hear or see anything else out of place in the dimly lit basement. I didn't know anything was wrong until I felt a strong arm wrap itself around my neck and pull me back into the hard body standing behind me. 
Chapter 15 Put it down. I knew it was Tate even before he spoke. I could feel his warmth and a sickening sense of delight even as he attempted to choke me from behind. Sean immediately jumped into action, swinging around to launch a fist right into the side of Tate's head, but he missed. Tate held me too close, and Sean could have injured me if his aim was even a little off. Why are you following me? I whispered as Tate swung me around. He kept me between Sean and himself. He was using me as a human body shield. How cowardly. I wanted to tell him to fight like a real man and stop hiding behind me. I told you, I can't let you out of my sight. His breath tickled my ear as he whispered his response, sending a trail of chill bumps running down my neck. I elbowed him in the gut. He grunted, but his grip stayed strong. He was holding me just tight enough to make me immobile without cutting off my ability to breathe. I elbowed him again. You've got to stop doing that, he grumbled. Sean picked up the fire extinguisher I dropped earlier and approached with madness shining in his eyes. Let her go. No can do. I've got proof of her broken soul now. I need to finish the job. This? I raised the tablet a few inches into the air. This isn't proof. The tablet has powers of its own. I'm still just a boring mortal. Hand it to me. I hesitated. Handing this tablet to him would be like giving him a piece of myself. I didn't want to share it, especially not with him. But remembering Sean's reaction to it earlier, maybe it would be able to take care of itself. I said a silent prayer. Okay, as soon as you let me go. I can't let you go. Then I can't give you the tablet. Tate groaned. I liked it better when you thought I was a charming international spy. I scoffed. I wasn't so far off. You've been on a secret mission to eliminate me all along. Don't forget the charming part. He pulled me a little closer. Your power is charming, maybe. Your personality could use a little work. I elbowed him a third time, irritated that my bony joint wasn't squishing into the softness of his belly, but slamming into the rock-hard wall of his abs instead. And I was irritated even more by the thrill that mental image of his abs gave me. Shake it off. He's got you under a spell, glamoured. He might be hot, but he's a jerk. All right, if you insist. His voice took on a song-like quality, a beautiful baritone melody that drew me in and made me want to hear more. I'll let you go, and you'll hand me the tablet. Yes, of course I will, anything you say. I couldn't speak, and my thoughts were no longer my own. If I find that you are controlling it somehow with your powers, you will submit to me, willingly, so I can collect your fractured soul, though I promise to make it enjoyable. Yes, I will submit. Everly, snap out of it! Sean's voice barely registered, and I wished he would just shut up. His voice was so harsh compared to the sublime sound of Tate whispering in my ear. It scratched at the inside of my brain. I needed Tate to speak to me more, to provide a balm for the wretched sound of Sean's words. Are you ready? Yes, I whispered. His grip loosened, but he kept his warm hand tenderly on the back of my neck as I spun to face him. He held out his hand, and I immediately moved to give him the tablet, not of my own control. Don't! Sean's voice called out again from somewhere behind me, but it was too late. I placed the tablet into Tate's open palm. Ah! He dropped it and released me, and we all watched in horror as the tablet fell to the cement basement floor and crumbled into rocks and dust. My wits crashed back in hard and fast. My soul felt crushed. No! I dropped to the floor and swept the broken pieces toward me in a pile. What is this? Tate demanded, his voice back to normal. He rubbed the inside of his injured palm. 
I don't know, Sean said, but she's not controlling it. The boys both turned thoughtfully toward me. They were just as confused about the tablet as I was. It's broken. Help me, please. We've got to get it back together. I'm sorry. Sean placed his hand on my shoulder. No. I shrugged him off of me. I wouldn't accept it. It wasn't too late. The pieces began to glow again, ever so faintly, as I pulled the pieces back into contact with one another. Hand that to me, I said, pointing to a large chunk of rock that had bounced several feet away from me. I'm not touching that again, Sean said firmly. To my surprise, it was Tate who moved for it, but instead of picking it up, he kicked it gently with the side of his shoe, sending it gliding back over to where I sat on the dusty floor, and that missing piece was all I needed. Reunited with the rest of the broken tablet, the pieces began pulsing again. I could feel it in my veins as life entered into the inanimate object once again. I sat back, and we all watched as the glow became too bright even for me. We shielded our eyes as the light grew blinding, pulsing faster and faster, and then darkness. Once my eyes readjusted to the low light, I reached out for the tablet. It was whole again. Not a single fracture line or crack were left as evidence of the destruction it had endured moments before, and it was cold, no longer pulsing or glowing at all. My heart sank. Our connection, whatever it was, was gone. Here, I said, the dejection evident in my voice as I held the object out for Sean. You can take it now. He stood, open-mouthed, seeing but not believing that the tablet was whole again. Are you sure? I'm sure. The sound of a police siren filled the room. Our time was up. I'll handle the cops. Tate said, turning for the stairs. I nodded, happy to see him go, but not trusting for a second that his intentions were pure. I don't recognize the writing. Sean held the tablet close to his face, squinting hard as he attempted to make out the message. Well, we don't have time to decipher it now anyway. We've got to get out of here. Do you think Millie or your mom might be able to help? I wouldn't show it to them, my mom especially. She's got a good heart, but she's devoted to my father, and he would be required to report it to the council. Until we know what it might mean, I think it's best if we keep this between us. And what about Tate? I gestured for the stairs. Tate has one job, just one. To kill me? Sean nodded. But not until he has proof that you're fractured. So what now? I stood and dusted the knees of my pants. Now we get the dogs back home to your aunt and pretend nothing happened. Then we make plans. I know someone who may be able to help us figure this out. She's a seer. Will she be able to help me find my mom, too? She's got a better chance than we do. His tone wasn't encouraging, but I didn't see any other option. This tablet was linked to me somehow. There was no denying it. I wouldn't stop searching until I found out what exactly it meant, and I wouldn't stop until I found my mom. Meanwhile, Tilly's hands struck the cool cement floor of the prison cell she'd just been roughly thrown into. She stood, brushing off her pants, and trying not to wince at the stab of pain deep behind her kneecaps. They might bruise, but her body would have them healed by nightfall. Her ego wouldn't heal so quickly. She turned angrily to face the man who had taken her captive. There's no need to be so rough, she scolded. He looked away, feigning indifference, but she knew the guilt he felt. She felt it too, a different flavor, perhaps. Her unlawful act had taken place long ago. It had time to ferment and settle in deep inside her. His guilt was fresh and raw. She knew Rossell didn't want to take her captive, but he had no choice in the matter. None of them had any choice. 
They'd done the unthinkable, and there was a price to pay for it. It looked like Tilly would be paying for it with the rest of her life, another seven hundred years or so. You could have at least arranged for me to serve the remainder of my life somewhere more comfortable, she frowned, eyeing the small, sparse room. This is the only place suitable for you right now. He lifted his face, revealing the sorrow swirling in his dark eyes. It was then that she noticed the diamond coating on the steel bars. It shimmered with the king's power. Barius was the only known keeper with the ability to render all other powers useless. He'd enchanted this cell to prevent her from teleporting out now that her powers were unbound again. Tilly pursed her lips and held Rossell's gaze. She hoped her silence would encourage him to talk, to tell her the rest of the story, but she had no such luck. After a few breaths of silence, he turned away. Wait, she called. He paused, but he didn't look back. What will you tell Everly? Nothing. She'll be afraid. She'll search for me, and it won't be long before... We'll handle it. His hands clenched into fists at his sides. Tilly gasped. No, you can't hurt her. Tell me you're not going to hurt her. Rossell turned slowly back to face her again, with eyes shimmered with unshed tears, but his face revealed no other emotion. He'd been practicing this look of resolve for centuries, and he'd mastered it. My allegiance is to the king. I answer only to him. And the prince? Rossell's lip curled, exposing receding gums over his ivory teeth. Don't speak of him. He? Tilly's breath was cut off sharply in her throat as bile rose in her chest. She grabbed at her neck, fighting the urge to panic until it finally calmed enough that she was able to breathe freely once again. The oath prevented her from speaking of the past, even to Rossell. You mustn't speak of the prince, Rossell said again. Then he turned on his heels and disappeared from her sight. The sound of a door slamming shut at the end of the hall signaled his exit, and Tilly slid down the cold concrete wall into a heap on the floor where she wept until her tears had dried and the bruises on her knees had fully healed. This has been Fractured Soul, Daughter of Sea and Sky, Book One, Part One.